Carrie, thank you very much. And it's uh, great to be on the call today. I want to begin with a special shout out to some fellow Hoosiers who I know are on the call from the IURC. Uh, folks, it's great to work with you and appreciate the relationship that uh, we share. I want to begin with a quick mic check of the four panelists. Um, Marcus, can you uh, say hello? Hey, can you hear me? Perfect. Awesome. Are you here? Hi, Senator. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Thank you. How about Great, Katie? Thank you. Hi, I'm here. Loud and clear. And Greg? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? I sure can. Loud and clear. Great. Well, um, well thank you all. And, and this session uh, deals with some things that actually we're dealing with in Indiana on a real-time basis. So it's uh, very exciting. And we have a distinguished uh, panel to present on this. Uh, today, we'll discuss state and RTO experiences leveraging and compensating distributed energy resources and coordinating interfaces in the electricity system. The session will examine ideas around the needs of a coordinated system and how states and RTOs play a role in developing a future-proofed system. This is a very unique set of speakers as we have a policymaker, a representative from state commissions, someone from an RTO, and a consumer advocate. So this session will likely not be short of topics. Now, in your materials, you have a uh, copy of their full bio. Um, I will give a brief introduction uh, right now of each. Um, as we move forward, if anybody in the audience has a question, please type it into the chat as we've been doing, and we'll see if we can get to it. And we also encourage uh, chat throughout, even if it's not a question. We know you're out there and have something to say and something to add to the conversation. So the procedure will be as follows. I'll give a brief bio of each speaker, and then we will go uh, speaker to speaker, uh, virtually handing the microphone to each other. We'll then uh, go to more of a group discussion and uh, Q&A. Our first speaker is Marcus Hawkins. Uh, Marcus is the executive director of the organization of MISO States. Our next speaker will be Mr. Asim Hawk, who leads a number of important functions at PJM, including the State Government Policy Division, the Electricity Infrastructure Policy Unit, and the Member Services Division. We'll then hear from Commissioner Katie S. Dykes, who is the Commissioner of Connecticut's Department of Energy and Environmental Protection. And finally, uh, Greg Polos, who is Executive Director of the Consumer Advocates of the PJM States. Quite a lineup, I think you will agree. With that, we'll first go to Marcus Hawkins at OMS. Marcus, are you there? I am here. Thank you, Senator Cook. All right, the floor is um, yours. Awesome. Thank you very much, and thanks for having me. Uh, again, my name is Marcus Hawkins. I'm with the Organization of MISO States. And uh, I will get into what OMS is and what OMS does in just a minute. Can we pull up my slides? I think, Carrie, are you driving or is it Danielle? I don't know. Perfect. Um, so we'll go to my, my first slide here. And um, as Carrie mentioned, there's a bit of a, a transition from the, uh, the last panel discussion to this next uh, conversation. So if we go to my next slide, um, uh, I'll show the map of the MISO footprint, which could not be larger and more different than the building to building transactions that were just being talked about. Uh, here is the, the MISO footprint spanning 15 states and a province of, of Canada, and it is, it is massive and it is large. And so um, in OMS, uh, we represent the collective interest of all the regulatory commissions within the MISO footprint. Uh, to help bring the voice of state regulators uh, to MISO and to FERC. And so um, it's, it's uh, really a much bigger, uh, bigger, bigger picture policies that we, we work with at OMS. And so um, I, I wanna just point out a few things with this map here. There's a lot of states, a lot of different states. You might assume that there's a lot of similarities maybe between the Dakotas, but you'd be wrong. Everyone is unique and has, a, has special interests. I think maybe, uh, uh, the most unifying aspect of, of all of these states is primarily their regulatory structure. There's a lot of vertically integrated states in the MISO footprint, uh, save for Illinois, which is a restructured state and a portion of, of Michigan. So that sort of, uh, you know, 
flavors all of the policy conversations that we have in the MISO footprint, especially as it relates uh, to the subject of DERs and how they participate in wholesale markets. Um, I would also want to point out that even within these states, there are, are differences in DER policies. There's, many of the states have multiple utilities within their, their borders, and, and they can have you know, very different uh, technological capabilities of communicating with DERs. Um, or different rate structures and, and retail programs that, that will impact how, how DERs are treated in, in the retail and wholesale market. So um, not only are there a lot of states and a lot of differences uh, within the states in the MISO footprint, but even within a, a single state, there can be some, some key differences. Um, and it's important to keep in mind that the majority of the value uh, associated with distributed resources um, really comes from those state policies and retail programs and not the wholesale market. So um, there, are, there are a lot of different retail programs and, um, and uh, rate structures out there, and that's really where the value of DERs is being felt today uh, throughout the MISO footprint. And so with that, I will go on to my next slide. And this slide is really just highlighting um, some of the proactive work that OMS has been doing over the last four years related to DER. So a long time ago, back in 2016, uh, we realized that there would be a, a lot of coordination required to to ensure that um, these two halves of the bridge actually meet in the middle and what's going on at the states and what's going on at MISO um, you don't result in a car plummeting into the water below. So we've been proactively uh, working on, um, on getting the various parties within MISO talking about DER and understanding and grappling with the issues of how DERs could interact in the future with the wholesale market. Um, so we had to be really intentional and had a lot of, of meetings and conversations, a lot of focused um, gathering of different uh, parties to start uh, talking about these issues. And a lot of that was geared towards an eventual FERC order coming down. Um, the NOPER, you know, issued in 2016 really uh, got our attention. And so we started working uh, at, a, at a pretty rapid pace. So the states were focused on uh, the, the typical things, you know, operation and reliability of the distribution system was uh, front and center in a lot of the commission's mind. Um, but we also started thinking about coordination uh, between the RTO, the regulator, and the distribution utilities. And so um, we had some, some key takeaways in that effort and getting ready, and that was um, we needed to focus on education and bringing in um, some new parties into the typical uh, RTO uh, meeting that don't typically participate otherwise. And so we had to be proactive in bringing them into the conversation. Um, we also had to consider the fact that uh, MISO during this time was undergoing and just kicking off a major technology overhaul. They were investing over $100 million in a, in a market system enhancement, and that would have a big impact in how resources could participate in the RTO in the future. So um, we needed to be mindful of that. And um, we were really focused on just making sure that whatever a state is doing with DERs um, and whatever they're investing in in their distribution system, that um, the MISO uh, market rules and the structure is able to accommodate a variety of approaches taken by the state. So um, that bottom arrow there uh, is illustrating the fact that in 2018, uh, OMS started to survey the entire footprint about the uh, quantity types um, location of DER within the, the MISO footprint. So uh, there's a lot of D, uh, DER that does participate in the MISO market, but we also knew there was quite a bit that did not. And so we started to um, try to gather some key data points uh, of what DER was out there. And we learned a lot through that process. We learned just how hard it could be to collect. Um, even just simple things like nameplate capacity of DER uh, from the, the many market participants in the MISO footprint. And so um, we, we definitely appreciate that, that visibility challenge for understanding how, where these resources are and the impacts they're having on the bulk system. And we also started to, to ask MISO members about 
um, some qualitative things related to DER, such as if they've been experiencing any um, bulk electric system impacts um, from their, their DER, if they're experiencing back, backflow and things like that. So um, we have now done that three times. It's the only footprint wide look of a DER in, in the MISO market. And uh, we're continuing to do that and improve how we gather that information and, and share that with the broader stakeholder community. Um, I will go now to the next slide, which is where I'll actually talk through some key examples of um, the, what is really the focus of this panel, which is the, the market coordination between, between resale, retail and wholesale. And so um, in, in the MISO context, this uh, really comes down to demand response. There's been uh, a very strong history of demand response participating in the MISO market. Uh, today, there's over 10 gigawatts and it represents about 10% of the, the peak um, capacity requirement for the MISO footprint. And it's really important to, to realize that a, a majority of that quantity is created through uh, state policies and retail programs. And those resources are not paid in the MISO market at all. They are on specific retail tariffs. They are registered at MISO. They are, they are counted as capacity. Um, in state resource plans, but they're, they're not receiving any sort of um, market compensation. Um, they are just dispatched by, uh, by MISO when needed. Um, those resources have been around for a long time. Um, they went about 10 years without being, being used at all from 2007 to 2017. And um, the last uh, few years, as reserve margins have gotten tighter, it's uh, become increasingly important to rely on those resources. And so um, it's, uh, it's become, a, I guess, a, lear a learning curve to uh, uh, realize that when you have 10% of your capacity tied up in emergency-only resources, you're going to have to get used to some emergencies being called. And so um, that's been going on and these resources have been being used with, you know, varying degrees of success and um, MISO and stakeholders have been working on some, uh, some key improvements into how they communicate with these resources because, because of the different ways they are deployed um, at the various utilities. And so MISO is doing some work on their tools for how they coordinate and communicate with these resources and utilities and states um, likewise are uh, looking at the, the specifics of these programs that create these resources uh, to try to, to better align the needs of MISO um, and, and how these resources are used. Um, another example is, oh, is uh, sorry, is uh, Order 841. Um, we've been focused on distributed energy storage and how uh, uh, retail uh, utilities and, and the MISO market uh, coordinate to, to ensure that there's no you know, reli reliability challenges or, or metering issues uh, between uh, distributed storage and, and what MISO needs to see. And the, the final result of that Order 841 implementation that is most important to the states is really a, a attachment to the MISO tariff that specifically spells out how distributed um, batteries uh, have to go about um, registering and, and meeting specific requirements needed um, by MISO and, and working with their distribution utility to actively participate in the market. Another key example that uh, Senator Cook may be familiar with is uh, Indianapolis Power and Light. Um, they did a DER pilot very recently uh, where they worked uh, alongside the IURC, which is an OMS member, and with MISO and Purdue University, and started grappling with um, the tricky question of gathering, uh, you know, solar DER information and um, trying to get a better understanding of how that information can be shared between the utility and the RTO. So they developed a draft solar uh, DER data sharing template. Um, that looked at, you know, what information might MISO need to know about these resources and uh, really just started to better educate all of, all of the stakeholders in Indiana on that. And uh, lastly, this DER task force is something that OMS recently um, proposed in the MISO stakeholder world 
Um, recognizing that there are a lot of different parties interested in DER, especially after Order 2222. They might not be the typical RTO folks from all the different utilities or the commissions. And so we wanted a, a centralized one-stop shop for where, <laughs> for, I swear I don't have a dog in this office, um, for uh, where you can go and easily tune in uh, to, uh, to the DER issues and help, um, you know, help as MISO works to comply with Order 2222. So that's been a really recent development, um, but it's been a key um, focus of OMS, which is making, um, getting the right voices to the conversation, especially given the tight timeline for complying with that FERC order. Um, we want to make sure that everyone who's interested and has uh, an, a perspective to offer is able to do so efficiently. And so that's part of that DER task force. Um, my last slide, if we'll go to that, just has some key issues going forward. Um, just picking up with what I just said, getting the right voices in the room is really critical. Um, we work mostly with the transmission planners and the wholesale market people at the MISO, you know, um, markets meetings and things like that. But there's distribution planners and people who work on their DER programs that need to be part of these conversations. So um, making sure that they know when to come and participate at, at the MISO stakeholder process is really uh, something that we're going to be talking about a lot over the next several months. Um, we're also going to be focused on some retail wholesale tensions and making sure that issues of double counting and, um, and metering are, are properly accounted for. And so um, that's something that could be unique from state to state. And we're going to have to work with the broader stakeholder audience to, to figure out those, those issues. And then um, lastly, we're going to have to come up with a participation agreement structure similar to how uh, battery storage was done for Order 841. Um, that that is flexible enough to uh, account for a bunch of different combinations of of different resources, and so there's a lot of work ahead. And um, the states are are really looking forward to being engaged uh, on these tricky and, and complex subjects at at MISO. So I'll leave it there for now. I I have some links in my slide for uh, some relevant um, decisions along the way over the past few years that might be helpful, and I look forward to the the conversation. Thank you, Marcus. Great presentation. And again, we're going to hold questions until the end. And at this time, we'll pass the virtual microphone to Asim Haq to give us a point of view from PJM. Welcome. Thank you, Senator Cook. And thank you to the council for the invitation to be here. Um, my name is Asim Haq. I head up uh, state policy and member services at PJM. In that state policy role, um, I oversee policy development and interaction with state government, which includes state commissions, governors, legislatures, and state security agencies. Um, I help to coordinate our PJM stakeholder process as well within the member services space. Um, before joining PJM, uh, I served as chairman of the Public Utilities Commission of Ohio. So. Um, have some relevant background in the state RTO dynamics before coming to PJM. I'm very pleased to discuss um, how PJM recognizes and works with states to help them achieve their policy goals. And I'll discuss um, the value of markets and other key activities, as well as funnel down into some of the areas that Marcus discussed. Um, all those areas are um, areas that PJM has interacted with as well. If we could go to the next slide, please. Now, first, the first thing to do um, for folks who are um, not necessarily uh, terribly familiar with PJM is uh, a view, just as Marcus did, of our footprint. So PJM helps to maintain reliable power delivery for 65 million people across 13 states and the District of Columbia. We plan the high voltage transmission system um, 15 years in advance and we administer wholesale power markets in our footprint. All of this, of course, under the jurisdiction of our regulator, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. Um, we are one of, go to the next slide, please. We are one of nine major grid operators across the country, and we are in the Eastern Interconnection, where you 
we're able to sort of visualize from the last slide what that looks like. And we always have to keep in mind that PJM and its states are part of one larger electric system here in the eastern half of the country um, that has to be connected and coordinated. I always like to say that, you know, electrons don't know state boundaries. Um, they know physics. Uh, and so something that we're always very conscious of, we work very closely with our colleagues in neighboring states and RTOs. Um, that coordination can lead to some pretty amazing results. As we sit here right now, our system is as reliable, our costs are as low, um, and actually um, we are as clean as we've ever been um, within our system, utilizing the regional economies of scope and scale. Next slide, please. We also have a very significant impact on the cost of living for our customers. As you see here, our markets and the various other components, um, our operations and planning activities, core business functions that we have here at PJM contribute an estimated 3.2 to $4 billion in savings each year to members and the region. Um, undoubtedly a wonderful piece of PJM propaganda there, but that I'm forced to put in every slide deck. Um, but nonetheless, uh, something that I wanted to provide as context to what PJM does on a day-to-day -day basis. Next slide, please. Yeah, so I really like this slide. I think this slide represents, um, as we sit here right now, um, the various mostly generation-related state policy initiatives um, in the PJM footprint, it is very busy. Um, and the PJM states um, undoubtedly uh, have their own unique set of policy endeavors that they are advancing. Um, there's more than just generation. Um, the, the concepts of grid modernization and what it means to individual states, their efforts in the grid security space, um, efforts on the transmission side, um, trying to plan for, for instance, what storage looks like in a world where um, you've got a, uh, a um, blurred line between distribution and transmission, um, a non-wires alternative world, and so much activity happening in our states, so much dynamic activity happening in our states. Um, as PJM views this, yep. you know, we see I'm states good. taking energy priorities into their own hands and we, we expect this trend to continue for the foreseeable future, whether based in climate, um, technology, economic development, or other reasons that are particular to individual states. Certainly no one size solution fits all though. Next slide, please. And this is an endeavor that we just started recently at PJM. Um, it operates under uh, the state government policy group that I manage and sort of in this rapidly evolving landscape, um, you know, we recognize that as our states evolve that we have to evolve with them. And so to that end, we have established a group that is purely committed to working with states to help them advance their energy policy objectives. Um, this state policy solutions group brings together PJM's expertise in planning operations and markets with also a very firm understanding of state law and regulation, really a, a true marriage of the substantive expertise of PJM core business functions, as well as specifically state law and regulation um, in order to help states advance these policy initiatives. It is a technical arm at PJM that exists you know, purely for that purpose. You know, we're currently focused on issues like offshore wind, resource adequacy, um, clean energy targets, grid security, the concept of grid modernization, which I think includes a lot of what Marcus covered with FERC Order 841 as well as 2222. And undoubtedly, um, a, a group that is going to be very pivotal to PJM going forward and in success in working with states as they advance their policy initiatives. Next slide, please. I can't do a public speaking engagement without addressing the MOPR, our favorite collective subject in the industry. Um, we have spent the bulk of this year um, navigating compliance with FERC orders um, on the capacity market. Um, we're really on a dual track here. On one hand, 
Um, we are running very far behind on running capacity auctions. So we are and have pushed to get um, compliance across the finish line with the FERC so that we can schedule and um, run auctions. And that um, schedule has in fact been produced. Um, on another hand, um, you know, we have said that our um, this, this construct as it exists today is not a durable solution in the long term. So having initial conversations with stakeholders, um, we had one at our annual meeting, actually Illinois Governor J.B. Pritzker um, uh, was able to uh, present to the PJM stakeholder community and our doors have been open uh, to those who are interested in having a conversation about the next iteration of the capacity market. So already having those conversations. Um, you know, just a particular issue that was of interest to our states, and that was the MOPR applicability to default service auctions. FERC effectively ruled that the MOPR would apply to default service auctions in our tariff language that FERC agreed with. What we stated was that, okay, um, the MOPR can apply to default service auctions. However, if certain requirements are fulfilled, those requirements being um, that the auction is evaluated by an independent consultant, that the auctions are effectively non-discriminatory, fuel neutral, competitive, that they would not be subject to MOPR applicability. Um, we worked with our states and members to craft this language um, and then post the FERC ruling um, that our language was, was acceptable, I believe it was October the 16th, um, we then got to work with our states um, to analyze their particular default service auctions to ensure that, um, in fact, uh, the, the MOPR as those auctions existed today would not um, apply to those auctions. And we published some guidance that our independent market monitor agreed with, um, wherein uh, uh, it does not appear as we sit here today that any state default service auction in the PJM footprint would be deemed a state subsidy subject to the MOPR. There's one tiny exception of 5% of DC's default service auction that was addressed by the FERC in its order. I'm an extremely challenging state specific issue um, that we were able to navigate with the tremendous assistance of our states. Next slide, please. You know, offshore wind is a major priority for um, our five coastal states, uh, North Carolina, Virginia, Maryland, Delaware, and New Jersey. You can see um, by this chart alone um, how much we're looking at in just three of those states. Um, next slide, please. 14,000 plus megawatts effectively. And you know, earlier I told you that, you know, we have a unit um, wherein we are trying to assist states and advance their policy objectives. This is a great success story of that unit in working with our states. We were recently proud to be part of an announcement with the New Jersey Board of Public Utilities um, that reflects this level of engagement and advancement in trying to assist New Jersey advance um, it's offshore wind objectives, specifically through the something called the state agreement approach for transmission build out. Next slide, please. So I think we're very aware that the system is changing pretty dramatically. Um, these are some of the challenges and opportunities that I think we see um, within the PJM space and certainly something that we will be um, evaluating within our stakeholder process and other venues. Um, changing load profiles, especially during the pandemic, is something that has been really interesting to monitor and try and determine through load forecasting um, what that dynamic will look like on a going forward basis. But just to note, um, a clear and fundamental understanding that the, um, the grid is transforming as we are watching it. Uh, next slide, please. Then really the crux of um, or at least a, an, an important component of this panel, um, FERC Order 2222. Um, you know, we, we do see distributed energy resources as being a very important part of the PJM future. Um, you know, right now in our interconnection queue, out of 122,000 megawatts of proposed projects, 108,000 megawatts of those are either wind, solar, storage, or hybrid. That's 88% of generation megawatts that are in our queue. 
think that FERC Order 2222 will have very broad impacts on the participation of DER and wholesale markets and represent, frankly, a new paradigm of collaboration that the FERC has in fact mandated as a result of 2222. It's not just sort of a de facto new paradigm. The FERC has in fact said, um, you need to create a new paradigm to collaborate under that order. Um, we are currently, Mark has mentioned, um, MISO stakeholder process. We are currently having discussions within our stakeholder process venue, um, specifically the DIRS um, subcommittee about 2222. Um, they will surely continue and only sort of enhance as we approach the compliance deadline for this particular order. Um, the last thing I'll note is, is that this year we, we advanced um, some interconnection process reform workshops, which I think dovetail um, um, very importantly with this sort of grid of the future that we see based upon the statistic that I cited. Um, I don't wanna, I could, I, could, I could continue to talk about all things PJM and its interrelation with state and DERs, but um, I think it's best to pass things on to Katie and look forward to engaging with all of you in Q&A. So thank you very much. Thank you, Austin. And we will now hear the perspective of a state regulator from Commissioner Katie Dykes of Connecticut. Welcome, Commissioner Dykes. Well, thank you so much. Uh, it's great to be part of this discussion today. Um, and so I serve as the commissioner of the Connecticut Department of Energy and Environmental Protection um, and I'm pleased to offer perspectives around state policy and what state regulators can do and what we're doing in Connecticut to be um, effective partners with our RTO um, to achieve our state policy objectives. Um, maybe the first place to start in the next slide is uh, really to talk about what is state policy. Um, obviously, as we talk about, um, you know, preferred policies and, and state efforts, um, frequently the focus is on clean energy uh, commitments. And in our state, for example, we have a statutory requirement to reduce carbon emissions economy-wide by 80% by 2050. And Governor Lamont here in Connecticut has also adopted by executive order a goal for us to achieve 100% zero emission uh, electricity supply for Connecticut ratepayers by 2040, which we're evaluating pathways to achieve that today. Um, we also have in statute preferences for specific types of resources, for example, a requirement that uh, needs should first be met with all uh, cost effective efficiency, for example. Um, so these are kind of, I think, uh, elements of our public policy that, that I see uh, some commonalities in, in other states around the region. Next slide. Oh. So we also have additional um, public policies, of course, uh, that include reliability, um, ensuring the optimal use of generation sites uh, through siting and permitting, another really important function at the state level um, that supports uh, uh, effic efficient markets um, and deployment of resources. And of course, ensuring that our ratepayers have low cost um, electricity. And so if you go to the next slide, one of the fundamental policies um, in our state as well is an emphasis on competition. So we deregulated in 1998. Uh, we are entering our third decade of being in an in a organized market. Um, and I think this is another really critical aspect of our public policy preferences, uh, which is to um, ensure that we can minimize ratepayer risk and achieve lower cost supply through competition. Importantly, um, our state made the choice to, uh, to emphasize competition both when we uh, enacted the deregulation statute, which, which uh, caused, called for um, the divestment of utility-owned generation and reliance on the wholesale markets uh, for meeting our resource ad adequacy. But the same statute also um, that, that uh, enacted deregulation also established our renewable portfolio standard and the state's energy efficiency program. And so I think it speaks to the, the kind of complementary um, vision that our state had and continues to have about ways to ensure our environmental goals um, and other goals can be achieved in harmony with our, um, with, through, with our participation in wholesale markets. That said, I think we are still um, uh, have, have a, a ways to go. Um, to achieve that, that harmonized vision. Um, this is a busy slide, but I just wanna share it um, to give a little perspective on, you know, as Connecticut has uh, 
uh, been um, ha having to rely on competitive RFPs for power purchase agreements um, to ensure that the clean energy resources that we need to meet our uh, renewable portfolio standard and our carbon emission goals, um, uh, you know, we've had to uh, utilize the RFPs to secure those resources because they're not uh, being procured through the market. Um, uh, we have had to put a significant amount of our load under contract just compensate paid for uh, by ratepayers through their distribution rates. And so we are, our state is uh, uh, participating in ICE in New England's markets, of course. We represent about a 25% share of the load um, in ICE in New England. And so obviously we um, are funding, our ratepayers are, are funding a 25% share of the costs of the, of the wholesale markets, including um, costs associated with various programs um, and RMRs and, and other types of stopgap measures that uh, the ISO has, has had to put forward in order to address things like um, uh, fuel security and grid reliability. At the same time, our state um, just recently uh, had to take on a 10-year contract to retain New England's largest power generator, um, the nuclear facility, uh, the Millstone Nuclear Facility owned by Dominion, um, which is a sizable amount of load uh, proportionate to Connecticut's overall uh, customer demand. And with that contract, we are now at a place where Connecticut has about 90% of our energy consumption under contract. So as there's been a lot of discussion, I think, in panels and conferences for some time, about the the divergence or the the the, the risk um, that um, uh, the the lack of harmonization between clean, clean energy goals and wholesale market designs could lead to duplicative costs um, and ratepayers having to fund uh, kind of two two separate grids, if you will. Um, unfortunately, I think Connecticut is is be, has become somewhat of an example of of the need for that harmonization because um, our ratepayers are having to pay these these duplicative costs, supporting retention of resources and capacity um, for uh, hundreds of megawatts of offshore wind and solar and other types of resources that we need to meet our, our legitimate state policy goals. Um, but looking to see more of, of the, those uh, investments being valued in the wholesale market or the wholesale market adapt to procure the resources that we need to meet our goals. So with all that in mind, um, uh, we we're very pleased uh, in October uh, that Governor Lamont uh, was joined by four other governors in New England um, to uh, sign on to a, a statement essentially um, calling for a new partnership with our with our RTO um, and the, the development of a, of a new framework uh, for uh, our wholesale uh, markets and, and RTO planning. Um, as the governor's statement indicated, um, all of our all of this participating states in this statement are accelerating efforts to expand clean energy resources and combat climate change. And uh, we have, you know, the governor's really acknowledged the need um, to uh, commit to long lasting, functional and transparent market based solutions um, to facilitate uh, New England's clean energy future. And the governor's statement was followed by a vision, uh, a vision document that was issued through the New England States Committee on Electricity, or NESCO. Uh, I'm, I'm proud to, to serve as Governor Lamont's representative um, on NESCO, uh, which has uh, been a very important place for dialogue among uh, the New England states on policy matters uh, related to um, the ICE in New England and wholesale markets. Um, if you go to the next slide, just wanted to introduce just a few of the um, of the topics and concepts that um, in the next slide that the uh, that NESCO announced in the vision statement. Um, certainly, um, wholesale markets are uh, a really important part of of uh, the the, uh, uh, the what the states are seeking and, and the wholesale market reforms. And if you could go to the next slide, it, it, it highlights that. Um, uh, so there's a vision statement that was issued um, by, by the states, and it's in it's been posted on the NESCO website, uh, which you can access at www.nesco.com, um, and it and it highlights that you know absent fundamental changes. Um, the result of the existing market structure will be that some states' ratepayers will continue to overpay for electricity uh, constrained by a wholesale market that is not aligned with a rapidly transitioning resource mix and consumer investments in clean energy and decarbonization. And we threw this statement together, all six states participating in NESCO highlighted um, that this is not a sustainable outcome. 
So the NESCO vision statement calls for a dialogue and um, efforts to advance a new paradigm in three, uh, three specific areas. Um, one relates to wholesale markets, and I'll talk about that one uh, um, first. Uh, essentially, um, we recognize the, the need to have, um, uh, let's see if you can go to the next slide. <laughs> Um, so actually, uh, actually, you can go to the uh, to, to the following slide. I'm so sorry. If you want to advance to the next, great. Um, so, with respect to the wholesale electricity market design, um, this all of our states in this vision document highlighted a few different requirements um, that we feel that our wholesale market really needs to um, to address. Um, we, you know, rather than um, uh, uh, reacting to this. Uh, the challenges of, of clean energy uh, procurements and, and um, not being reflected in the wholesale electricity market as a, as a way to turn away uh, from competition and our commitment to deregulation. In fact, through, through our participation in this statement, you know, for Connecticut, we see this as really doubling down and re-emphasizing um, that we, we, our commitment to uh, competition and market-based mechanisms, because we recognize that in order to meet our clean energy goals, which will require a substantial um, build out of new resources across the grid, that we need market-based mechanisms in place to ensure that those resources can be procured at the least cost um, to, for our ratepayers. We also, um, with a blend of existing resources like nuclear and new uh, resources, hundreds and thousands of megawatts of new renewable and other resources that need to be developed, we need effective mechanisms that can accommodate both existing and new. Um, and I love the, the uh, discussion earlier about um, planning for uh, DERs. Um, you know, states uh, with their jurisdiction over uh, the distribution utilities have been pioneering and, and, uh, and, and evaluating uh, through grid mod dockets um, investments and new operational capabilities um, on the distribution grid uh, for the distribution utilities, in addition to supporting tariffs for the deployment of more uh, customer side resources. So there's a huge opportunity here to ensure um, that there's effective planning and integration of um, the distribution side uh, investments with the operation of the uh, of the of the bulk power system. Um, so these are just a few of the different elements uh, that are highlighted here. The in the vision statement, our, the states also reflected a need for an appropriate level of state involvement in market design and implementation. I think this is just a really important one. As we've called on um, the ICE in New England and, and highlighted the, the, our, our desire for a, a more effect, a proactive and, and um, productive partnership with the ISO, I reflect as well on how we as state regulators can be um, good partners for our RTO um, at the same time by providing more predictability um, and, uh, and, and better uh, assessment of what our clean energy needs will be over time. Um, if you go to the next slide, um, transmission system planning is, is another really critical one. The fact that so much of our clean energy is being procured through our state jurisdictional and state operated uh, uh, RFPs means that it, we have challenges in ensuring that the interconnection uh, needs or the transmission build out um, necessary to enable the new clean energy uh, uh, projects to get built may not necessarily be reflected in the RFP criteria and evaluation, um, certainly with offshore wind, but also with solar and other types of resources or that are being built out. We recognize that we're going to be facing challenges of curtailment um, and ultimately not getting the value that we're looking for from uh, these rate pair of act investments if we don't have um, the uh, transmission included in, 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 in proactive planning um, that is informing the procurement of clean energy resources. So this is another really exciting and really important element of what the states highlighted um, in the vision document. And to the next slide, the third uh, and, and final theme of the vision statement also focuses on governance. Um, this has not been, I think, a front and center kind of topic over in recent years, but I find, I feel that it, it is really critical for us to have discussions about um, how to 
update governance structures um, to ensure that they are facilitating and supporting, um, again, that productive partnership between states and RTOs. Um, uh, certainly, a lot of the governance structures that were put in place were done at the, the beginning of deregulation, and a lot has changed and evolved about the state in the state's roles around directing resource mix um, through our clean energy programs. Um, but I think through improving um, transparency, uh, looking for best practices across other RTOs and other um, uh, uh, analogous um, um, entities, we can find ways to ensure that our ratepayers are getting the best outcomes um, in meeting all of our various policy goals um, through the stakeholder process uh, and, and the development of new programs and, and tariff changes that the ICE New England is putting forward, um, particularly respecting FERC's jurisdiction over the ICE New England uh, uh, activities, um, but the interrelationship with things that are very much um, uh, uh, matters of state interest and, and, and um, an interest of policymakers uh, at the state level. Um, and, and with this emphasis on governance, I hope that we can also, you know, we'll be able to provide, again, um, uh, some uh, benefits as, as state policymakers to help to provide for better alignment around siting and permitting um, considerations, um, providing for better predictability around our clean energy uh, goals and, and procurement needs. Um, these are things that are just a few examples uh, where I think this productive partnership can be very, very uh, beneficial um, as we look to work together uh, with our RTO, with our sister states um, uh, towards um, a reliable and affordable and, a, and clean uh, uh, grid transition in, in the years to come. So I appreciate the opportunity to share uh, what we've been doing in Connecticut um, as participants in, in uh, NESCO and ICE New England and look forward to being part of the discussion uh, at the end of the panel. Thank you so much. And we thank you, Commissioner Dykes. Uh, our final panelist will present the uh, view of the uh, consumer. And Greg Polis is consumer advocate of the PJM States. Uh, Greg, good to have you here. Great, thank you, Senator. Can you hear me? We can, thank you. Great, always the first question. I uh, appreciate the time. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you to the council, and in particular to Carrie Worthington for all her efforts getting this panel set up, I, I really do appreciate it. And um, I'll even double down and say, I really do appreciate you um, as the council, including the consumer perspective um, on this panel. I, it's a big issue for me in 2021 to make sure that the consumer perspective gets included and considered. Uh, and sometimes, or a lot of times conferences will let other vested interests um, speak on behalf of consumers and even commissions. Um, and so I do appreciate you including our, 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 our issues and our perspective on this. Um, I did want to level set and kind of start with a little bit of um, what CAPS is. So could I go to the next slide? Great, so uh, I am executive director of CAPS, Consumer Advocates for PGM States. Uh, and there are 16, state advocate offices in, in the PGM region. There are actually 13 states, as Awesome had mentioned, plus DC, that's 14 jurisdictions. And I do have two states, North Carolina and Illinois, that have two advocates. So I do have 16 members that I help work with to make sure that they know what's going on at PGM. And the next slide. This is a little bit about uh, our, about CAPS and what we do and our mission. Um, I really do kind of help them as members of PJM, at least 14 of them, to know what's going on at PJM, to be engaged, that's all of them, but I can help the, thir the, the 14 to vote as well, because they do have voting in the end use customer sector. Uh, and our mission is to actively engage in the PJM stakeholder process, to be engaged, to be involved, to vote, uh, to ensure that the price prices consumers pay for reliable wholesale electric service are reasonable. Uh, and that's really uh, what we focus on at all times and every day within the PGM region. Um, I did want to uh, talk about the intersection of regional markets and state policies. If we could go to the next slide. Um, I did want to start with a few of my conclusions um, that states have a right to make certain choices. Uh, for example, as Awesome mentioned with resource adequacy, and the types of resources that are used, um, states have that right, Federal Power Act. And it's something that 
debated a lot with talk about carbon, uh, where that kind of intersection comes, but it certainly is the position of the advocates uh, that, that you need to lean on the states on that. Uh, and Austin did a great job when he was the chairman of Ohio Commission of kind of saying, that's the legislator, that's the state function. Don't talk to the, even the commission about that. Um, RTOs uh, can be a great asset uh, to the states, and in particular PJM, where, where I'm familiar, but should not replace state agency functions. Um, third, regional is broader than just states, and the purpose of PJM is to harmonize all of those goals and interests. But every state is different, and things get complicated as you get the regional perspective. And putting that together can be difficult. And as you focus the relationship between the two, um, between states and, and the region, DERs are not a significant part of that function yet, system yet. It's getting a little bit more every day, and of course, demand response is the exception. Demand response as a component of DERs has been a huge significant part of PJM and really a successful part of PJM. Um, go, yeah, I think Austin had mentioned this, there is a subcommittee that's obviously looking at uh, order 2222, uh, DERs and inverter based resources subcommittee. And it's really just kind of getting started now on what we're looking at um, and where to go with the next stages. Um, but I did wanna look at, when we were looking at this slide, uh, I love this slide. Uh, this slide is, is kind of taking PGM's wholesale costs, and, and PGM presents this slide every month. Uh, and it's, it really, to me, helps kind of give you the data to show the real advantage of PJM, which is its c competitive markets. Uh, and I think that's where PJM has been such an advantage for consumers. Um, if, you look, if you look at the blue sections, I know they go up and down on each one of them, but by year, um, that's your energy prices. And while there has been high years in 2018, there's been low years, and you can see 2020 has been very low energy prices in the region, incredibly low. And obviously that has somewhat to do with COVID, but even if you look at 2019, you can see those numbers, that energy price, $27.15 for consumers as a wholesale cost was significantly low, very low, and was historically one of the lowest since 1998. So then you go about 30% lower to that with $21 in this last year, and you can see that there's been significant advantage for PGM having a wholesale competitive energy market. Uh, the other number I point to here is the reliability number, which is that green color. Uh, and you can see it goes up and down, but right now it's on the lower end. Uh, again, PGM has done such a fantastic job on a regional basis of providing uh, great value to customers um, in, the capac in that capacity level. Uh, and PGM's mission, it's, it's important to note, PGM's mission is to ensure reliability at least cost to customers. And it's a very simple one. It's not about having other interests within it. It's reliability at least cost to customers. And you can see by this right now, PJM is doing a very good job of meeting that mission. Um, and I know Austin doesn't hear that much from me <laughs> because we, we are going into discussions and debates on different issues, but I just think that PJM does such an outstanding job on that front. Uh, I'll go to the next slide real quick. So I brought this slide here, percent of installed capacity by fuel source, because the other thing about when you have a, a competitive market, that PGM has done such an outstanding job with and, and provides such a benefit to all the states in the region is if you look at um, from 2011 to January 1st of 2011, the calendar, the year starts on June 1st every year. So June 1st, 2011 was 10 years, almost 10 years ago right now. So or coming up on 10 years. And you can see that orange, which is coal, and it used to be 40%. And by the time we get to June 1st of 2021, it's going to be 30% pretty significant decrease uh, at that resource. But on the other hand, natural gas was able to, was able to go from 30% to 50% and growing. So you can see that when you have a competitive market, it's doing exactly what it should. It should allow for opportunity for new resources, um, which, is, which has been incredible in the PGM region. Natural gas has made such a difference. And I wonder if you didn't have a competitive market, if it would be that significant. Um, of course, if you look at the, the if you're looking at the top and, and the the key, and you're looking for solar and wind, 
those are negligible still. So as we talk about DERs and, and, and renewable resources, there's still a long way to go. The other resource, of course, to talk about is demand response. And demand response is PGM market on capacity resource has done such a fantastic job of incorporating that resource and gives a lot of promise for DERs as, as a potential pathway, at least in some respects. Okay, so now, um, if it's okay, can I get you to go back one slide? Thank you, that was easier than I thought. I was a little worried about that, that's great. Um, so, as I mentioned, PGM is a shy example. As a competitive market, IMM, that independent market monitor, and the independence of PGM are very valuable um, as to uh, developing and, and operating this competitive market. But not everything is perfect. Um, and so that I kind of look at the, I point you to the orange bar on this slide. So orange is the transmission piece of PGM wholesale costs. And as you can see, while it, it, the whole entire bar goes up and down, the orange is going only up. And that's your transmission cost. And they are going up year by year. Uh, and in significant frame, if you look at from 2016 to 2020, from $7.53 to $11, that's 44, that's 45%. Uh, you look at just in the last year, you're looking at like 15%. So we've had significant increases on the transmission end. And from that aspect of the relationship, there is a, some, some concern as you talk about the, the, the relationship between the states and PJM. And I think one of the bigger message I have, I know my, the, my members have, is that is actually more of a, a function of PJM's cost of service. Uh, review and analysis, not really a competitive market on the transmission aspects. And that does, has, it has shown co some concern for us because um, it's not that market focus. And whereas in the state level agencies, like the, the commissions, you have important surf safeguards like accountability, transparency, oversight, which are really a focus uh, and a strong part of you know, your government agencies and you get to be, have more appreciation as you deal with a PJM or region, regional organization, which at best is a quasi-regulatory organization. Uh, and while it has some accountability, some transparency and some oversight, it is a private entity. Uh, and so it doesn't have the same levels. Uh, for example, uh, on just one example, PJM does have confidentiality agreements with the transmission owners, one of the members. They have common interest agreements with those members, which you would never have that at a state level with an agency. So those kind of things separate it and make sure that you have that need that for the state agencies to, to stay accountable and to stay as the, the core uh, leader on these things. Um, so another one I would act, actually kind of point out to this, and, and a, the difference between the state and the regional and kind of where the states fit in is right now, carbon pricing is obviously a big issue in how states think of that issue. But right now uh, at PJM, the PJM, the PJM stakeholders have said, are meeting with the PJM board to talk about carbon pricing and interconnection queue issues. And they have, the, the PJM stakeholders with the board's agreement have said, you, commissioners, you state entities are not invited in that discussion. They want time on their own without you in the room to talk about something like carbon pricing. So just as an appreciation and the, the regional fit, I mean, the states still have such a clear point. And as I mentioned before, my takeaways, states have that right to make certain choices of resource adequacy and that and the type of resource that are used. RTOs can be a great asset to states, but should not replace state agency functions. And the regional is broader than just states. And you have to remember that as PGM's purpose is to harmonize all those to the best of their ability. And uh, every state in our region, as Mark has kind of pointed out in the MISO region, is very different. And to the extent PGM creates a competitive opportunity for DERs and a state chooses to avail themselves to it, that is great if you can, take your, if you can use it. Um, and from a consumer advocate position, my state advocates are typically well aligned with their state commissions on regional matters from like the, the, from the Kentucky advocate to the Kentucky Commission or the Indiana advocate to the Kentucky or to the Indiana Commission, pretty well aligned in their positions. Uh, and that will change from state to state, but not within the boundaries. 
Uh, and I, as I kind of pointed out in an in initial discussion we had on this, that your state legislators typically say what your goals are, whether they're RPS goals or some other goals out there. And our, um, our state's advocates are typically looking to get the lowest cost within those parameters. So if you have an RPS standard, so how do we go to the regional level as a state advocate and, and advocate for to meet those RPS standards within the confines of what we, we have in a state level, uh, which is similar to what the commissions are doing as well. So with that, I will end and we can go to questions. All Thanks. right, Craig, nice job. Uh, we do have a couple of uh, audience questions. Uh, two are, are related, and I'm going to actually read them both. Um, pull one up here, excuse me. All right. Uh, the first is, from each of your perspectives, where does the buck stop? In other words, when thinking about the role of DER in the system, is there an entity that should have the final say-so? in how DER will work and be compensated. And the second question is related, and it asks, there are several local flexibility market platforms being deployed in the EU and Australia. These platforms span multiple distribution company territories, facilitate DER and demand flex transactions between aggregators, multiple distribution op operators, and wholesale markets, and are operated by neutral third parties. Is there a need to adopt a similar approach across the U.S., presumably at the state level? Awesome, Hawk, I know you have a four o'clock hard stop. I'm going to begin with you. What are your thoughts? Yeah, thank you, Senator. So, look, from the RTO perspective, um, you know, where, where the buck stops is where our regulator tells us the buck stops. And so we've got FERC Order 2222, which provides us some pretty decent guidance surrounding um, sort of the um, various buckets of responsibility. Um, I think that um, having the distribution utilities and the state regulatory authorities um, dealing in the actual physics of the grid and the engineering of the grid and um, really controlling the interconnection of these resources. Um, just my own personal opinion, not the opinion of PJM or the management of PJM, I think, you know, very smart. Um, I think that that um, local level reliability is something that cannot be compromised as we advance um, 2222 or DER participation in wholesale markets. Um, so, you know, the, the, you know, sort of the easy answer is what our regulator tells us to do um, is where the buck stops. Um, I would say, though, I, I think also that there is, um, there again is an acknowledgement and I think some some good thought put behind the, the real mandate that um, RTOs um, must establish a collaboration paradigm with state regulatory authorities as well as um, distribution utilities in order to ensure, you know, we're all, we all are in this um, game for, you know, various purposes, but I think reliability is one of those things that we can all sort of fortify and get behind. And so I think that that is, um, there's some real logic in the FERC having done, um, uh, mandated that particular piece of the order. Thanks, awesome. Marcus, your thoughts? Yeah, I think um, there's a lot of control still left with, with the state uh, commissions. And so primarily that's around interconnection standards. And so that's really how the resources are studied and connected to the distribution system. States get to define that process completely with their utilities. And so, um, you know, that's, a, a, that's not where the buck stops. That's kind of where it starts, but it has a big uh, impact on, on how it ends up playing out at the end of the day. And then also in order 2222, um, it was interesting that, you know, FERC uh, made it really clear that uh, states and their retail programs can condition participation in a state program on whether or not that resource is participating at the wholesale market. So uh, a state has the right to say you can't participate in this retail program if you are um, in the MISO market providing some sort of service. And so if it's true that the value is primarily in those retail programs and on the distribution system, um, having that uh, ability to do that, you know, gives the state a lot of control over how those DERs participate. 
And then my last point is related to how this worked out with uh, electric storage resources on the distribution system for order 841. Um, MISO was uh, limited in how many um, exemptions a utility could have for recalling uh, a storage device on the distribution system. So if it's participating in the market and there's some reliability issue on the distribution system, um, FERC made it uh, kind of the exception to the rule that a, a utility can can prevent that resource from participating if there's an issue. So there there was um, you know some tension there, and I think with uh, Order 2222, that that same sort of process will have to be ironed out as well. Commissioner Dykes, and then we'll go to Greg. Yeah, you know I think I think there's. Um, there's a lot of discussion underway here um, in ICE New England uh, on, uh, on Order 2222 and how compliance will uh, move forward. But I do think that, you know, just at the highest level, look, we have to find a framework that works for uh, the integration of these types of resources. I mean, as we look at the policy and investment that will be needed to meet um, deep decarbonization goals, including 100% zero carbon electric grid goals, we have to you know, have a focus on those balancing resources, including demand response um, that can help to, to uh, if, uh, integrate um, the intermittent renewables in a, in a low emission way. Uh, so, so I think this this is really you know it set us on the path to um, to to figure this out, and, and we're eager to roll up our sleeves and you know work work with the stakeholders um, in the NEPL process and with the ICE New England um, on the, the how how to do this effectively for New England. Uh, Greg, your thoughts? Yeah, so I uh, it's good to follow up on, with Commissioner Dykes because. I kind of look at DR and I had a lot of experience in the DR world when that came out, uh, when order 719. Uh, and I do think the states, state regulators uh, do need to have a lot of say on, on if not all the say on, on what, what resources can, what DERs can um, be engaged in that in the regional market. I will say that's going to have a big impact though, because there are some states who are going to say, some regulators who will say no, uh, and particularly the, in the regulated markets, that's happened with uh, the DR world. And, and there was a separate order, there was 719, but then there's a separate 719A that kind of talked strictly about jurisdiction. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised if there's much, another statement about jurisdiction on, on order 2222. But I do think that has a big impact because certainly where you have had um, those deregulated markets have been a little bit more open to allowing DR to participate without restrictions, um, where in the states that have allowed it, uh, that's been a big impact on, on who, can, who can be involved. Thanks, Greg. In the chat box, Joe Palladino with the U.S. Department of Energy has posed the question, in the planning process, is there an effort underway or conceived to undertake scenario analysis to examine various levels and configurations of renewable and distributed resource deployments with respect to needed supporting infrastructure costs? Great question. Who would like to take that first? I can take a stab at, at that. I, I'm familiar um, of how MICE has been grappling with that. And I know they do every year uh, their transmission planning process looks out at a variety of different scenarios. They call them their futures, and they have different renewable uh, assumptions that are a part of each of those futures. And uh, in the last couple of years, there's been a specific uh, carve out for where those renewables are located. And this is especially true for solar as it's entered the MISO queue. Um, in the transmission planning context, they've had to make an assumption of what portion of that solar will be on the distribution system versus on the bulk electric system. And so um, they've worked with a third party consultant to try to understand the impacts of DER and distributed uh, solar and, and then work that into their existing transmission planning process. And then the results of that, that study and those scenarios looking at the different futures will give you an assessment of some of those infrastructure impacts of what, what's needed on the transmission system. Yes, Senator, from the P, yeah, from the PJM lens, um, the answer is yes, and we, we are going to continue to um, evolve. I think the statistic that I gave you, um, as far as 88% of our 
um, generation um, interconnection queue being comprised of particular resources is um, a pretty um, staggering statistic. So a couple things, um, you know, first you saw the work that we have been doing with the state of New Jersey. We're doing work with, you know, frankly, all of our states that have advanced um, offshore wind objectives to try and determine um, from a planning perspective um, what the right dynamic there um, is and we'll continue to have those discussions. Um, we also, I think I referenced the interconnection planning workshop. There certainly have been discussions within the existing stakeholder process framework, but um, within the interconnection process reform workshops, um, definitely uh, the whole concept of continued and deeper integration of renewables and what that will look like from a planning perspective and what studies, scenario and otherwise need to be done um, to best inform that grid of the future, certainly a subject um, being discussed within that venue. And Mr. Greg, I, I'll just, uh, I think Austin did a great job of, of saying what I was going to say. I just add um, the next in PJM interconnection discussion is Friday morning or Friday all day. So if you're interested in the subject and want to know more about it, there is ongoing discussion starting this Friday. We'll take the plug. <laughs> Commissioner Dykes. Sure. Let's so, from the state regulator's perspective. Sure. So um, here in New England, there's been a, a, a pretty, um, uh, it, it, I'll say, uh, intensive effort um, that's been underway, a future grid process that um, the ISO and states and stakeholders in NEPL have been participating in, um, or as a, a sort of um, uh, a one-time kind of effort to really look at um, studying uh, these types of infrastructure cost needs. But I will say that um, uh, this is something that really needs to be uh, um, part of regular planning process um, going forward. And this is another great example, I think, of where states um, uh, have a role to play and can assist um, at the, the RTO in doing this type of planning. We really have a mutual need for it. In Connecticut, when we deregulated, our legislature uh, continued, though, to require that the state do integrated resource planning, even though um, we're, we're joint, entering into a, a competitive wholesale market structure. Um, and so that integrated resource planning or IRP process continues to this day and it's done by our department and we are about to issue our latest draft IRP and it gives us an opportunity to then model various scenarios of different types of um, clean energy resources that are can meet, for example, our 100% um, zero carbon goal. So that's a real positive. Um, getting on a path where we could um, be, provide that kind of um, scenario planning for the types of resources that we're pursuing um, on a regular basis that's aligned with um, the planning on a proactive planning on the ICE New England side for trans transmission infrastructure, for example, I think would have a lot of mutual benefits. But it, I think the ISO has been more in the sort of reactive mode in terms of um, uh, their transmission planning process, again, reflecting their mission that doesn't have the clean energy goals, you know, um, embedded within it. So I think that this is kind of an example of, of, of the kind of state uh, and, and regional sort of mutual benefit that would come from syncing up um, some of the different planning um, efforts that fall out of our, our distinct jurisdictional roles. All right, and we have five more minutes, but a really good question here, and I'll, I'll do it in the form of a lightning round. The question asks, states like New York and California have done a lot of work on the relationship between a distribution system operator and RTO. What is the status in your areas on development of organization and communication lines between the retail utility and the RTO, if any? Lightning round. Greg, why don't you lead us off? Oh, it's a good question. So retail utility uh, and the RTO, they, they clearly have a very good relationship. I would think in some cases too good a relationship <laughs> um, because they are considered part of the transmission owner sector. And as a transmission owner sector, um, someone like, um, let's just take AEP or Exelon will have 17 to 20 votes, the lower, lower sectors. Uh, they do, as I mentioned before, they have a couple um, common interest confidential agreements with the, the RTO. So I, I think they have a very strong relationship. And uh, as part of a bigger organization, those transmission owners 
have the ability to say that we're going to leave the RTO at any time. They are voluntary members. One of the big issues that we deal with uh, as a consumer advocates is, and many members of the RTO, is that the, R, that the transmission owners say we're leaving and we're taking our um, distri distributed distribution companies with us at any point. And so that's a big threat to an RTO um, and how it runs its business. So I, I actually think that the, they have probably too much power on this, on, within the structure. Marcus, how are the lines of communication in MISO? Um, they're, they're varied throughout the footprint in a pretty major way. So you have, you know, different utilities making some, you know, smart grid investments that are increasing the visibility of DERs. Um, and there's a lot of big AMI deployments going on throughout the footprint. Um, but really where that interfaces with MISO is still at the utility level. So depending on what technology is in place, that then impacts, you know, how that utility sees those resources. And it's probably only seen by MISO and how those utilities um, bid uh, their demand into the MISO markets. And so not as discrete resources participating, it's just how they understand those resources to impact their overall load profile. Um, so it's kind of an indirect participation, but MISO has started to try to uh, better understand the various uh, um, technological capabilities of the distribution utilities. And so they did a visibility survey uh, over the summer to start to, you know, get a lay of the land of what type of technology is out there um, when they start to think about that coordination between the, the communication pathways. Commissioner Dykes, what are those uh, lines of organization and communication look like in your state? So, uh, you know, I think this is a really, really important question for state regulators, for utility commissioners to be focused on, for example, um, for those reasons that Marcus was highlighting. Um, as, you know, utility commissions are contemplating billions of dollars of investment in, in advanced distribution, uh, you know, derm systems and other types of um, kind of uh, a centralized infrastructure that can help improve the visibility and control and dispatch of distributed energy resources, um, weighing the value and the cost effectiveness of those uh, of those investments really necessitates making sure that there's going to be um, actual uh, utilization and leverage of, of that infrastructure from the RTO and the way that they're managing and dispatching um, the bulk power system. So we we that that in ensuring that that um, that you know, communication is happening operationally um, is really critical to uh, getting comfortable with the value of those of those types of investments. So we, we count on that, you know, very much. Utilities are also, uh, you know, uh, managing our energy efficiency programs as, as administrators of those programs, um, which include demand response uh, 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 programs. They are through their affiliates um, perform, bidding into our renewable uh, procurements. So they're participating in that way, in addition to being transmission owners. Um, and their ratepayers are uh, crying out because they're confused about, rightfully so, about why they're paying for so much generation in their distribution rates. Um, you know, that we should be getting you know, clean energy uh, reasons in distribution that they really should be getting through them through our generation charge through, through the wholesale market. So there are many ways uh, where this communication uh, is very critical. All right. With that, I want to thank each of the panelists for a very enlightening uh, program. And at this time, I will hand the virtual gavel uh, back over to Danielle for the next section of the program. Thank you all.